Amen. Amen. Would you please open up your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. This morning we're going to begin looking at the path of Scripture beginning in verse 13. And as you turn there, let me remind you that last week we heard about the two not good confessions. We were considering the beginning of chapter 16 and we saw the Sadducees and the Pharisees and how they were staunch in their unbelief, though they saw the signs themselves. The, also in verses 5 and following, we saw the disciples distracted, darkened by their lack of faith and Jesus rebukes them as well for little faith. They saw all that Jesus did. And here we're considering really the breakdown of Matthew's gospel. That is from chapter 11 all the way through our passage this morning. It's been focusing on Jesus. They want Matthew and the Holy Spirit behind him has been wanting you to see Jesus. Showing that he is the great expected one. He's greater than John, chapter 11. That he is the one who walks upon water, chapter 14. That he's the Lord of the Sabbath, chapter 12. He's the sower of the good seed, and so and so on. He's the one who shows manna from heaven, the great I am. And yet, unbelief and little faith remain. Well, today, we get to see faith displayed for us. Before we read the text, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you would do what you can only do, that you would open up our eyes, that we might see wonderful things in your Word. Do this for the glory of Christ our Savior. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse 13, this is the word of God. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, why, or excuse me, who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? The emphasis is on you here. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whoever shall you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should not tell no one that he was the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, there it is, what we've been waiting for. Finally, the moment has come, and someone amongst all the people that have been seeing the miracles of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, someone finally gets it. They understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah to come. He is the Son of the living God the one that we have been waiting for, promised ever since the beginning, Genesis 3, 15 and following. Jesus is the Christ. Though the Sadducees and the Pharisees remain in unbelief, and the rest of the disciples, as we were shown last week, struggled with little faith, here now Peter makes that great confession. You know, this moment is in the Scripture Uh, much akin to or like the event of us and how we've been praying for someone for so long to come to know Christ, to make, to, to, to see Jesus for who he is, to believe in him. And then finally that moment comes and it's exhilarating, isn't it? 
I mean, you're, you're almost, you can almost sense the Holy Spirit is in them because you're just filled with the Holy Spirit as well. And you are just exhilarated, electrified, celebrating. Well, that's really what's going on in this text. There's a celebration going on. And it isn't just because Peter sees and believes. No, he also does something else. It's what he does in verse 16. He confesses. He takes the words upon his lips and he says, you are the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He makes a profession. It isn't just something that he thinks is good, true. It isn't something that he just believes in his heart. But he's so bold in his thought and in his faith that he's willing to take it upon his lips. Paul says, we believe, therefore we spoke, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And that is exactly what is going on. Peter is making a profession of faith. And young children, and perhaps even adults here this morning, if you ever have to get in front of a group of people and make a profession of faith, you know what I mean, right? I mean, how significant of a moment is that for every eye in the room to be looking at you staring you down perhaps even speak, looking peering into your soul it's embarrassing right it's terrifying little children don't want to come up here and make that profession ah that's not the reason we have it is to make people afraid the reason we do it is because a person who really believes will, like Peter, confess with their lips that Jesus is Lord. Real belief will be evidenced, and that evidence is a confession. And that's, what's, that's, that's what Peter is doing. He's making a profession or a confession of faith. And I, and I must confess something to you. If there's anything that... I or the session together with the diaconates and even any longtime member of this church, what we're longing for more than anything else is for this to happen in your life. For you to see Christ in all his beauty, to see him as the one who forgives you of your sin, who receives you, who says, come, I will bring you to the throne room of my heavenly father inviting you in to know that God is your God. We long for that moment and for you to make, to take upon the lips as Christ says, that he who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. And see, this is what we're moving towards. And if there was any a moment that we would have an altar call, this would be it. Now, we don't believe in altar, altar calls. We don't believe in that. And you're about to see why, in point number one, why we don't embrace the theology of altar calls. Because it's not about flesh and blood. It's not about emotionalism either. It's about the work of the Spirit within. And see, the one in whom the Spirit really works, you don't need an altar call to force the moment. They're going to make a profession of faith. And they will not let anyone get in the way because they now see that Jesus is Lord. But if there were ever a moment, if there's anything we're really pushing you for, we, other than that, this isn't an altar, beloved. You, you can see the way it's shaped too, right? There's no table here. There's no sacrifice here. There's a pulpit, and there's a podium to be seen, to hear the Word of God. That's what we believe in. We want you to believe. Now, in that being the moment... As we look at our text, I, I want to focus in on verses 17 through 19. And, and the reason is because I, I see the stress, the focus of it, being upon the blessing that follows Peter's confessing. Did you notice that? Verse 17, uh, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. It's a blessing. He's speaking of the blessing that comes to Peter. And then verse 18 is a statement as well. He says, I also say to you, meaning the blessing's not stopping there. 
I'm going to keep giving. Oh no, verse 19, look at the gift he gives. He gives something. This is all speaking of a blessing being extended. It's a bl- the, the blessing of Peter's faith-filled confession. The blessing of confessing. And I think that's better than focusing on verse 14 and saying John the Baptist and who others may think Jesus is, Elijah or Jeremiah. Really, that is not true. (laughs) He is far more than that. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that we have been speaking of. And so I want to talk about now the blessing that comes from confessing. I really have two points this morning. The first point is this. They're both A's. The first one is this, that the first blessing of confessing is, number one, assurance. Assurance. Let's look. Verse 17. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or that Bar-Jonah is son of Jonah or John, okay? Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now it's clear, as Jesus says, that there's a, there's a blessing that follows Peter's confessing. He, that's what Peter said something in verse 16, and Jesus responds. He said, or the Greek is, he's actually responding to what Peter says. It's very clear. But Jesus also makes very clear that Peter is blessed because of something. And he says that word, because... And he says, it's not because flesh and blood revealed this to you. That the confession you're making isn't the result of any personal characteristic, some spiritual savviness, some intellectual understanding. No, it has nothing to do with you, Peter, flesh and blood for you to see this. No, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying that divine revelation came to Peter in order for him to make that profession. Divine revelation came. That's the only way people make a profession of faith, is that God has to reveal himself to them. That's what Jesus is saying very clearly. Flesh and blood did not reveal this. But Jesus is saying more than that. Because he is blessing Peter, he is extending to him a precious statement of assurance. Because as Peter makes the profession, he's saying, God has done a work in you for you to see that. And see, more so than us stressing our faith and what we can do if we make a profession. This is the work of God showing it to us, and it proves to us that we are blessed. How? That God did a work in us to see it. Now, this is wonderful, because if it is God who began the work, Philippians chapter 1, right? He is going to be faithful to do what? Complete the work. It's based upon God. God is the one who is to be glorified in our seeing. How that comes back to us, though, is is a statement of assurance. Let me explain this. We all love that hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. And I forgot the rest there. But it's a great, it's a great hymn. Now, what gives that person the ability to sing that? Is it because they have made a profession? No. How do we know definitively that Jesus is mine? How do you know? How are you grounded? And see, I was talking to uh, some, we were talking last night, a couple of us, and we talked about how in the altar call system, there is this, perpetuation, or, uh, perpetu- is there, not, not, there's this uh, continualness, forgetting the word, of stressing the individual in what they do. Uh, and and one, indiv- one member of that group that was discussing it said, I, you know, I went down the altar ten times. And by the tenth time, the teacher said, because it was during the chapel, 
services, the teacher said, I think you're a Christian. I think you've got it. But that tender conscience was troubled because it was all about her and all about what she did. And see, what she did that past week wasn't good enough to warrant Jesus. She knew that she was a sinner, and she had to keep coming forward and feeling like, I've got to do this all over again every single week just to earn favor in his sight. But oh, when that, in our conversation, we moved on, and another said, oh, that's when I came to love the doctrine of election because I learned it didn't have to do with me. It was all about God and what he did. And if he started a work, he's going to finish the work. The doctrine of assurance based upon God. Now, some of you this morning may be saying, you just put out that word election as if it was <laughs> something I embrace. Predestination, you're probably going to say next. Yes, yes, I will. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about election and predestination, that God does the divine work, and he is the one responsible for that work. But I, in reply, will say, I will confess, that it's Jesus who brings this up. I didn't bring this up. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says this. God is saying this to us. But the number two, I'm not here to hurt you this morning with that statement. I'm here to help. And see, this is the, this is the matter that perplexed me as a new believer. I used to think that the doctrine of election and predestination was like a short dagger you carry in your back pocket. And when someone started talking about free will or anything like that, I just got it out and started sticking them in the back with it, right? Here are the verses I can show you for that. Romans 9, boom, boom, boom. I hit them up. And the reason I did that is because that's how the doctrine worked on me. It got me that way. I was not a believer. I started hearing about election and predestination, and I hated it, and it felt like a sword was being driven right in the middle of me. And it humbled me. It burst my balloon of pride and said, there's nothing good in me. No good thing could I ever do to be accepted in the sight of God, and I didn't like that. Really, truly humbling. But... Though that was true for me and though I was able to see Christ through that, I began to understand that it wasn't a primarily a dagger or some sharp sword. This doctrine is what is known as a shield. As the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, I am the Lord your God, your shield, your very shield. So too, this doctrine of God's working in you is to help you fend off not the stabs and pokes of the, of the Reformed Christian, but the fiery darts of the devil as he accuses you of all the wrong things that you've done. And what you say is, it's never been about me. <laughs> You're right. You can even say, I agree with you, accuser. Accuser of the brethren. I am a great sinner. But a great Savior saved me by his good work and he revealed himself to me. God did this work. And this is where I, I was started convinced of, you know, like Ephesians 2, 9, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith and not that of yourself. It is a gift of God so that no one could boast. It's God's gift to us. Or, or Romans 9, 16, the one chapter I just appealed to, so that it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And really, this doctrine comes as a statement that God has had compassion on you, has healed you. And it's really for the tender conscience who is constantly perplexed and conflicted. Not the one who is wandering off in their sin. No, they need to experience, the, as the author of Hebrews writes, about the dangers of walking into sin. No, we're talking about the, the, the faltering, tender-hearted Christian that looks at them and says, oh, I have done this, I've done that, and oh, there's no way that Christ could save me, such a great sinner. If that's you this morning, let me tell you about William. Uh, William, uh, in the 20th century, 
actually, excuse me, 19th century, early, William was abducted from his family. One day, he was on the, the coast of the beautiful shores of Africa, and then the next day, he was thrown down into the hold of a ship to be confined to be a slave forever. Now, that's evil. That's called man-stealing in the scriptures, and it's called out as sin. You can't steal men <laughs> or women. And yet, despite the evil of men, though man meant it for evil, God meant it for good. How so? How can you say it's possibly good? Well, how the Lord began to work out the rest of his young life. Uh, William was, was assigned to, by the grace of God, to a captain, to be his personal helper. And in being his helper, he had liberties. He was able to, he was afforded shore time. Captain Wells, we don't know if he was a believer or not, but he gave to William a Bible. William also learned how to read that Bible on his own. Couldn't even read the Bible, but he did. But even though all that happened, William struggled. Upon one of his, having a tender conscience, upon one of his journeys to America, William went off the shore and was able to hear a street preacher proclaiming the news of damnation for sin, that God will judge you for your sin. It convicted William. Also preached about Christ, how he died for sinners to take their, pay, their punishment for them and then raise them up to newness of life. And William heard that and, and wanted to believe that. He kept coming back day after day to hear him. And his, his own words, as was the recollection of one man, was that this preacher knew me, though he didn't ever meet me. Well, he continued to wrestle with his, his conscience, not finding assurance of forgiveness. And one of his next store, uh, shore duties was in England, where he was afforded the opportunity to go to a church regularly. And he heard the word. He, a pastor met with him and knew his tender conscience, and knew the need for him to be assured. And, and one particular Wednesday evening, there was this following conversation, I quote, William, I think I can prove to you that you do have faith. Did you, by your own self, your own ability, begin to think that you were a sinner and to feel your own need for a savior by yourself? William said, oh no. <laughs> it, was, it came when I thought nothing about it at all. But do you think that Jesus Christ and his salvation is most desirable? Oh, yes, I do, said William. Do you believe he is able to save you? Yes, he is able to save completely and forever. Do you think he is unwilling to save you? I dare not say that, said William. He is so good and merciful, kind, to say that he will never cast out anyone that comes to him. William, do you wish to be, do you wish and strive to keep his commandments? Yes, pastor, because I love him. Are you willing to suffer for his sake should he even call you to do so? I think I could die for the love of him. He did not think it too much to die for me. Why should I, should I a wicked sinner, think it too much to die for him, the good and righteous Savior? And seeing the presence and it, Everyone that was watching him that Wednesday, that small group, you know, typically on Wednesdays, right? A small group of people was just beaming with admiration at this young man and the faith that he had. And so William said this, excuse me, the pastor said this, William, like Jesus would pronounce it, your faith has made you whole. William was baptized that very Sunday. Now, the reason I bring that up is to bring home the fact that William felt the conviction of sin, saw the beauty of Christ his Savior, was willing to confess him before men, and all that testified to what? His confession, that he has a true confession. But how did that come about? In William's own words, it was the result of not himself at all, but God. God did that work, and that when you come to that, you understand that God has done that work. That's a token of assurance that you need to hold in your hands. He's working in your life. 
you can't see him and love him. You can't even feel bad for your sin if the Holy Spirit wasn't heavy upon you. All of that points to what? The Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Christ Jesus. It points to assurance of the work that he's doing in you. And so, beloved, as we think about this first blessing of confessing assurance, I long for you to make a confession. I'm talking to the little ones here and those who have not made a profession of faith. I long for you to do that. Because I long for you to have the assurance that is afforded to you when you understand. Not just because you get up here and say, I do, I do, I do, right? It's more so because of the real faith that is in you that is willing to confess. There's a blessing of confessing. So please, young people, those who haven't made a profession, do that, I pray. That's number one. But number two here, as we think, not just of assurance, But the second blessing of confessing is that you are given an advocate of the church. Now here, we're going to turn to verses 18 and 19. And I'm going to say to you, I am not prepared to dive into all that is here in these verses. Okay, I'm not. We don't have the time for it. I would love to do it. And we're going to do it next week, Lord's will. But I wanted you to see the big picture first. Okay, so I, I, we're just going to go through these verses very lightly on the, like a 30,000 foot view, view, going over them so you can begin to appreciate the blessing of confessing. Next week, we'll do like a little mini series on this verse and we'll call it something like the church, whether you like it or not. Okay, so here today, I just want you to see the blessing of confessing and that blessing is that you are given the church. Verse 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, for here, I just want you to see, Jesus is saying also, here's the blessing, also, and he's blessing Peter because of the faith-filled profession that he made, right? And he makes a promise in there, right? That promise is right in the middle, smacked out of the middle, I will build my church. Now, this is the first time this, this word church, ecclesia, is used in the scriptures in the New Testament. Okay, it's going to be used once more in Matthew and then a whole bunch of other times in Acts. But this is significant. Jesus is actually announcing a building project. He's saying, I'm doing a building project, right? <laughs> and I'm building my church. He's telling you, I'm building my church. I promise you that I'm going to build. This is the establishment, the blessing of the establishment or the institution of the church. But then secondly, again, we're glossing over a lot. We're going to come back to it next week. Verse 19, look at this. Look back with me. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Where you loose on earth shall be have loose in heaven. And here, just look at the basic structure. I will give speaks of one who has authority or possessions a lot of things and he's giving it to somebody and in the ancient world when you had keys you may have thought you had power but really you were an administrative role you were a servant doing a job doing a task for the great one who authorized you or gave you that task and the task they've been given has something to do with binding and loosing Some sort of a task. Now, right here for the moment, I just want you to notice that their their role is an administrative role to do work on earth. But here's where I want to stop. Because herein lies the point we need to appreciate. That greater than just being prompted, and more than just literally building upon Peter's confession, Jesus is saying that the church exists for those who have been filled with faith like Peter. And he's announcing that this church has been given to perform a function here on earth. And that function is to help. Christ gives you an advocate, someone to come alongside of you. Now, Why do I stress this? Because 
Many people these days do not see that. There are a lot of lone Christians out there, aren't they? Living on their own, doing their own thing. I've got Jesus, my Bible, and that's it. Maybe the Holy Spirit if they have a good theology, right? But I've got this, right? I don't need the church. But can we just say it like it is? They're not doing very well. I mean, the, on the out, on everything external, it may seem going well, but likely their marriage is falling apart. Likely their children are, are not doing well. Likely there's some great tragedy in their life. They're not doing well. And, you know, just, just to think of lone, uh, lone range, you know, uh, lone ranger Christians, you know, even the lone ranger had help. You know, remember the whole series, right? Tonto, Daniel Reed Jr., remember that one? And then Silver, right? He had help. Even the Lone Ranger had help. And see, if the Lone Ranger Christian just understood that we were never made to make it on our own. We have the church. Christ gave us the church to perform a function. I'm going to build my church. And the extent that we are willing, we're going to talk about more about this next week, to be a part of this church, you're going to find a great advocate. Yes, the Holy Spirit is your advocate. Yes, Christ is your advocate before the throne. But here on earth, tangibly, we have one another. Now, you may tell me, Pete, there's a reason why I'm a Lone Ranger Christian, and that's because the church has hurt me. Isn't that true? And, you know, it's not just the Lone Ranger Christians. It actually can be Christians who are still in church, but they remain on the fringe and the edge. Likely, there's been some hurt or pain caused by one or two or maybe members or maybe even the the session or diaconate. Someone someone hurts. And being on both sides of that, being hurt and then actually just hurting people, though that was not intentional, I get it, and it grieves my heart. And I want to say I'm sorry. But I also want to say this, though, that remember, there's only one who's perfect. And in this statement, Jesus isn't promising that the the church is going to do a great job. They're just serving the king to the best of their ability. And so my, my plea to you this morning is to not miss out on the blessing that comes through joining a church. Confessing and saying, yes, I believe, and being a part of a church, and saying, yes, this group is here to help. And you know, I know it's hurt, and it's hurt me, but can I tell you, I speak from experience, that if you're willing to do the hard work of working through that hurt, you're going to find great blessing. Sorting through that. Maybe you've got to sort, maybe you got to sort it out with me. Maybe I've done something I don't know about yet. <laughs> I hate to think about that. That's what keeps me up in the middle of the night, that I did something wrong. But tell me, I, I want to know that I've done something wrong. And then the other officers of this church need to have that mentality as well. The session has already talked about that. We want to be approachable. We want to be an aid to you. We were stressing that at the, at the session meeting here this morning. We want to be an aid and a help. And we don't want people, whether they're in the church or outside, to say they're no help. Yeah, we get it. They've hurt. Can you help? Let's let's sharpen one another. Maybe what needs to happen is that the reason why God allowed you to go through that is so that you could be the very Josiah or Moses, or whatever, to lead the people forward. To show them what they're going through. To show them their their error. To be that prophet Nathan, to come in and declare to the king what they've done wrong. That needs to happen. Because there's a blessing to be found here in the church. And I got to tell you, please do it. Every time that I've, uh, every time that I have found, I've found myself being hurt. Rather than slipping into being, you know, withdrawing, being bitter and saying, I can't believe these guys and whatever it is. You know, the the stuff we all do in our homes, we talk about one another. You see what, I can't believe what they said to me. What you need to do is you need to, Matthew 18, do that process. Go to your brother, sister, tell them. Go to, 
bring it to the church. If the church is wrong, bring it. We've got presbytery. <laughs> you can bring things out from the presbytery, general assembly. There's a whole process for how the church is to work through its problems. And can I tell you this? If you're working through something and you haven't found success, it's like a private matter. You haven't found the help that you need. Maybe it's a particular sin in your life. Maybe it's uh, uh, you're calling out for the Lord to do a great healing. But perhaps you, you long for your spouse, your children to become believers. Can I? Most people don't try the church. You know, I'll, I'll end on this. Um, one of our great friends just this past week had surgery. And there was a concern. This isn't, this isn't Dan Apazo. Okay. This is a friend back in South Florida. And she, there was fear that she had ovarian cancer. And my brave wife encouraged her to tell the church. To pray for them. Now, what are you going to do? You can't tell the church they got you know, all this stuff from like girl parts, right? So you don't talk about that stuff, right? You don't want to talk about that stuff. It's embarrassing. So they went in, the doctor said to her, this is what I'm going to do if I find cancer. And she was like, oh no, I don't, this is the process that we're, I, I have to tell you this because you have to consent to it because I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. Well, no, you have to agree, agree to it. But I'm, this is what I'm going to do. You have to know this. But she had the people praying for her. And they were ministering to her and her family. And, and do you know what happened? Nothing. It was nothing. And she came out and it was just, you know, unremarkable stuff. That just was nothing. But her testimony is greater. She said, I'm so glad that I shared my struggle with the church because they were a great help for me. Beloved, you need that too. You need that help. You need that help in your marriage where it's not working. You need that help in your life where you struggle with sin because it's, you're hiding it. You need to bring it to the light and help. The church is here for you to support you, not to condemn you and point you down and say you have this wicked desire and you're wrong. Say, look, we're here. This is God's word. This is his son who's died for you. And now hear his, now be ministered to by his spirit, by and by his people. Beloved, we need this advocate. And so my passionate plea for you this morning is don't hide in the shadows those members in the church or those who haven't made a profession of faith. Make it. Talk to me. Talk to me about the new members class at our church or join a church. All these things you will find a great, great blessing. You hear me, church?